Welcome to Investor's Secret and today we will be checking Peter Lynch and his 8 rules to become wealthy in investing. The single, uh, single most important thing to me in the stock market for anyone is to know what you own. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. They, they would not be able to tell you why they own it. They couldn't say in a minute or less why they own it. Actually, if you really press them down, they'd say the reason I own this is the sucker's going up. That's the only reason they own it. And if you can't explain, I'm serious, you can't explain to a 10 year old in two minutes or less why you own a stock, you shouldn't own it. Now without further ado, let's begin. Starting off at number eight, the small investor can do extremely well in the stock market. I frankly think it's a, a tragedy in America that the small investor has been convinced by the media, the print media, the, the radio, the television media, that they don't have a chance. Big institutions with all their computers and all their degrees and all their money have all the edges, and it just isn't true at all. And when they're convinced, when this happens, when this occurs, people act accordingly. They, when they believe it, they buy stocks for a week, and they buy options, and they buy the Chile fund this week, and next week it's the Argentina fund, and, and they get results proportioned to that kind of investing. And that's very bothersome. I think the public can do extremely well in the stock market on their own. I think the fact that institutions dominate the market today is a positive for small investors. These institutions push stocks on usual lows, they push them on usual highs. For someone that can sit back and have their own opinion, know something about industry, this is a positive. <coughs> it's not a negative. Coming down at number seven, study history and know that markets decline all the time. But you should study history, and history is the important thing you learn from. What you learn from history is the market goes down. It goes down a lot. The math is simple. There's been 93 years a century. This is easy to do. The market's had 50 declines of 10% or more. So 50 declines in 93 years, but once every two years, the market falls 10%. We call that a correction. That means that's a euphemism for losing a lot of money rapidly, but we, you know, we call it a correction. And uh, of those 50 declines, 15 have been 25% or more. That's known as a bear market. We've had 15 declines in 93 years. So every six years, the market's going to have a 25% decline. That's all you need to know. You need to know the market's going to go down sometime. If you're not ready for that, you shouldn't own stocks. And it's good when it happens. If you like a stock at 14 and it goes to six, that's great. You understand the company, you look at the balance sheet, and they're doing fine. You're hoping to get to 22 with it, 14 to 22 is terrific, 6 to 22 is exceptional. So you take advantage of these declines. They're going to happen, no one knows when they're going to happen. People tell you about it after the fact that they predicted it, but they predicted it 53 times. So you can take advantage of the volatility in the market if you understand what you own. Closing in at number 6, you only need a few stocks in your life to be wealthy. So you only need a few stocks in your lifetime. They're in your industry. Let's say you're an auto dealer the last 10 years. You would have seen Chrysler come up in the minivan. You've seen, if you're a Buick dealer, or a Toyota dealer, a Honda dealer, you would have seen the Chrysler dealership packed with people. You could have made 10 times your money on Chrysler a year after the, the minivan came out. Ford introduced the Taurus Sable, the most successful line of cars in the last 20 years. Ford went up seven-fold on the Taurus Sable. So if you're a car dealer, you only need to buy a few stocks every decade. When your lifetime's over, you don't need a lot of five-baggers to make a lot of money starting with $10,000 or $5,000. So in your own industry, you're gonna see a lot of stocks, and that's what bothers me. They're good stocks out there looking for you, and people just aren't listening, and they're just not watching it. And, uh, they have incredible edges. People have big edges over me. They work in the aluminum industry. I see aluminum industry is coming down, inventory is coming down six straight months. I see demand improving. In America today, you know, you know, it's hard to get an EPA permit for a bowling alley, never mind an aluminum smelter. So you know when aluminum gets tight, you just can't build seven aluminum smelters. When you see this coming, you can say, wait a second, I can make some money. When an industry goes from terrible to mediocre, the stock goes north. When it goes from mediocre to good, the stock goes north. And it goes from good to terrific, the stock goes north. Now at number five, buy stocks where you have an edge or familiarity. You need an edge to make money too. People have incredible edges and they throw them away. I'll give you a quick example of uh, Smith Klein. This was a stock in, that had Tagamet. Now you didn't have to buy Smith Klein when Tagamet was doing clinical trials. You didn't have to buy Smith Klein when Tagamet was talked about in the New England Journal of Medicine or the British version, Lancet. You could have bought SmithKline when Tagamet first came out, a year after it came out. Let's say your spouse, your mother, your father, you were a nurse, you were a druggist, you're writing all these prescriptions. Tagamet was doing an amazing job of curing ulcers, and it was a wonderful pill for the company because if you just stopped taking it, the ulcer came back. See, it, wasn't, it would have been a crummy product that you took it for a buck and it went away. But it was a great product for the company. But you could have bought it two years after the product was on the market and made five or six times your money. I mean, all the druggists, all the nurses, all the people, millions of people saw this product, and they're out buying oil companies, you know, or drilling rigs, you know. <laughs> it happens. Three years later or four years later, Glaxo, even a bigger company, it's a huge company, a British company, brought Zantac, which was a better, at that time, an improved product. 
And you could have seen that take market share do well. You could have bought Glaxo and triple your money. Getting to number four, never be in a rush to buy a stock. He said you have plenty of time. People are in an unbelievable rush to buy a stock. I'll give you an example of a well-known company. Walmart went public in October of 1970. 1970 went public. Already had a great record, 15 years performance, great balance sheet. You could have waited 10 years saying you're a very conservative investor. You're not sure this Walmart can make it. You want to check. You're, you're, you see them operate in small towns. You're afraid. They can only make it in seven or eight states. You want to wait till they go to more states. You keep waiting. You could have bought Walmart 10 years after they went public and made 35 times your money. If you bought it when they went public, you would have made 500 times your money. But you could have waited 10 years after Walmart went public and made uh, 30, over 30 times your money. You could have waited three years after Microsoft went public and made 10 times your money. Now, if you knew something about software, I know nothing about software. If you knew something about software, you would have said, these guys have it. I don't care who's going to win, Compaq, IBM. I don't know who's going to win Japanese computers. I know Microsoft, MS-DOS is the right thing. You could have bought Microsoft. Again, I'm repeating myself, stocks are not a lottery ticket. There's a company behind every stock. And you, you can just watch it. You have plenty of time. People are in an amazing rush to purchase a the security. They're out of breath when they call up. You don't need to do this. We are now at number three. Be flexible. Do not have any biases. People have all these biases, all these prejudices. They want to buy high growth industries. They won't buy financial companies. They won't buy savings and loans. They won't buy uh, companies that start with the letter R. I mean, I, you know, there's all these rules. They all hurt you. There are great stocks everywhere. There are stocks that are near bankruptcy, stocks in bankruptcies, stocks about to go in bankruptcy. There are companies on the new high list that are attracted. This company's on the new low list. They're all over the place. They're in growth industries, non-growth industries. Don't cut yourself off to one segment. People have way too many prejudices, too many biases. Now at number two, buy a business any fool can run, because soon one will. I like to buy a company any fool can uh, run, because eventually one will. You really want to do that. When I bought Toys R Us, they had the formula right. Any four people in this room and me could have run Toys R Us. We wouldn't have done as well as they did. They're spectacular. But for the next 15 years, we had no competition. We had a great formula. We could have rolled with it. They probably would have done three times as good. They were the frosting on the cake. But they had the formula right, no competition. The department stores know what they're doing. There was no copycats. And they were going to just roll for the next 25 years. Same with Circuit City. So I want the story to be solid. If management can add anything on top of it, that's great. I want to buy the story. Assume management leaves the next day and they're replaced by the next generation. That's fine with me. If management can add something to it, that's great. I'm not going to buy it because people say they have great management. Because you'll notice great management is always attached to stocks been up the last eight years. You ever notice that? Because I looked at Reynolds Metals. I used to follow Reynolds Metals. The stock has had the same person run it for like 30 years. When, st when the aluminum was tight, they'd say Reynolds Metals has great management. Aluminum going oversupply is these people are idiots. Then aluminum get tight, they say these people are terrific. I mean, it all to do with the price of aluminum. And they keep rating the management by how the stock's doing. It's very hard to measure management. It'd be wonderful to do. If you could spend months with them, really see them in action, then you'd know, but you don't really get that chance. Be flexible. Finally, at number one, know what you own. The first point is know what you own. I can't believe how many people own stocks and they couldn't describe to an 11-year-old in two minutes or less why they own this thing or what it is. The only, if you actually pin them down and you put a whip to them, they'd say the sucker's going up. That's the only reason they have for you. The, uh, this is the normal kind of company that people buy. This is a, a very simple story. I own a lot of companies like this. They make a relatively mundane product. Uh, it's a one megabit SRAM, CMOS, bipolar risk, floating point data IO array processor with an optimizing compiler, 16-bit dual port memory, Unix operating system, four whetstone megaflop polysilicone emitter with a high bandwidth, that's important, six gigahertz double metallization communication protocol, asynchronous backward compatibility, peripheral bus architecture, four-wave interleave memory, token ring interchangeable backplane, and they do it in 15 nanoseconds of capability. Now, if you own a piece of shit like that, <laughs> you will never make money, never. Did you enjoy the video? Please let us know by hitting the like button and subscribing to our channel. You can also comment what your thoughts are in the comments section below. And while you're still here check out these videos about investing as well. Thanks for watching and make sure to keep these investing.